Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for our Women, Wealth, and Wisdom webinar. Um, before I forget, a couple of housekeeping items before we dive into the content for tonight. Um, this session is being recorded, so if you miss anything and want to go back to it, we will be sending it out next week. And then as well as, as we only have about a half an hour, 45 minutes today, we won't be taking questions at this time. But if you have anything you're wondering or have questions about, feel free to email us at info at emerge360.com or we're happy to set up a phone call or meeting or whatever to answer your questions. So before I jump into the content, my name is Heather Jordan. I am the Managing Director of Emerge 360. I'm also a CFP or a Certified Financial Planner. I do all of the financial planning for the Emerge 360 clients as well as several TrustPoint clients. Um, if you don't know, Emerge 360 is a division of TrustPoint and we launched back in 2021. And we focus on working with clients who have assets of amounts of 50,000 and up, as well as doing a lot of financial education, financial planning and things like that. So TrustPoint, like I said, Emerge360 is a division of TrustPoint. We've been around um, for over 100 years now based in La Crosse, but also have an office in Minneapolis and Eau Claire. We do a bunch of different things, including trust and estates, investment management, retirement plans. We have a family office, and then we also do foundations and nonprofits. Um, if you have any questions about our services or how we can help, again, feel free to reach out to that email, info at emerge360.com, and we're happy to help you or point you in the right direction. So our agenda today will be a couple of different things. We'll talk about challenges women face, key investment principles that every woman should know, making your money work for you, um, different common scenarios that we see with our financial planning clients, and then specific steps you can take today to kind of enhance your financial journey. So let's start off with women in business, kind of the facts and lay the groundwork for where women are today in business. So women are starting businesses at twice the rate of men. Women own 40% of all businesses in the US and those businesses generate 1.8 trillion annually. There are 114% more women entrepreneurs than 20 years ago. So super great. Things are trending definitely in the right direction. Women hold over 30% of board seats in the U.S. So of companies who have boards, 30% of those um, board seats are hold, held by women. And the number of women in the 1,000 1, top executive positions at Fortune 100 companies has increased by 27% since 1980. So you can see a ton of progress being made by women in business. Shifting to women and wealth, 54% of working women are primary breadwinners for their families. Millennial women are twice, almost twice as likely as women in the baby boomer generation to earn the same as their partners. And the gender pay gap continues to narrow with women earning 84% of men of what men make, um, which is up from 64% in 1980. Um, some of the differences or reasons why women earn less than men can be shown by women kind of leaving and entering the workforce if they're taking care of children. And then also women are more likely to, to take care of aging parents or aging relatives. So they're kind of entering and exiting the workforce for those events. Women control more than a third of U.S. household financial assets, which is over $10 trillion. And baby boomers are projected to be worth $30 trillion in wealth by 2030, with women expected to control the majority of that wealth. And then 30% more married women are making financial and investment decisions than five years ago. Um, this is pretty much what we're seeing kind of in the industry. Women are taking over more and more of the responsibilities of financial planning for their household, the budgeting, the saving, kind of making different investment decisions. So the focus of this presentation is to give you kind of the basic tools and then just some key takeaways, things you can work on tomorrow, next week, next month to make sure your financial plan is intact. So I'm going to jump to key investment principles. Again, these are principles that 
every woman should know, understand. Some of these are things you've probably heard in meetings, but you don't want to ask what they mean or you don't have the opportunity to ask what they mean. Um, so we're going to go through kind of basic principles. So first, what is a bond? So you probably go to meetings or you hear with your 401k stocks, bonds, what's the difference? So bonds is the same as fixed income, which is essentially like a lender. So it's a debt investment in which an investor loans money to an entity. The issuer borrows the funds for a defined period of time and typically at a fixed interest rate. The issuer pays the bondholder a periodic interest payment or coupon and the full principal value at maturity. So if you've heard of treasury bonds, corporate bonds, municipal bonds, um, government agency bonds, these are all different types of bonds. Typically bonds are less risky than stocks, so less risk and typically less reward than stocks. So on the flip side, other than a bond, there is a stock, which is known as equity or ownership. So it's a share of ownership in a company. There's a holder of stock, which is a shareholder, and they have a claim to part of the corporation's assets and earnings. Um, ownership is determined by the number of shares a person owns relative to the number of shares outstanding in the market. Um, you can own individual stocks in Apple, Disney, uh, Microsoft, public companies have stock that you can buy through individual stocks or mutual funds, which we'll talk about. So as I mentioned, there are a couple different vehicles for investment. Again, things you might have heard in meetings, your 401k plan, meeting with maybe a financial advisor that you haven't had the opportunity to ask. Again, just high level what these mean. So individual stocks, you know, there's pros to this. This is if you want to buy, for example, Microsoft stock. It can be or is highly liquid. There's no annual or ongoing fees you have complete control over the investments and companies you choose to invest in. So if you don't want to invest in stock A, you don't have to. If you want to invest in stock B, you're able to do that. And there's also some tax efficiencies with that. You can control capital gains by timing when you buy or sell things. There is more risk with individual stocks than a well-diversified a mutual fund or portfolio. If you have all of your money in stock A and nothing else, you're not diversified at all. So pros and cons there, kind of depending on what you're looking for, for a long-term strategy for your portfolio. They can be time intensive. You must make sure to do your research on funds and make sure you're investing in something that you believe in and that you think will provide a positive return for your portfolio. On the other side, you can also invest in mutual funds. So a lot of 401k plans have these IRAs. You can just buy mutual funds in just a normal taxable individual joint account, things like that. So basically you own a bunch of different small pieces of funds into one investment. Um, these are convenient and often take less time because instead of just buying fund A, you can have mutual fund, with um, you know, pieces of different companies within that fund. There are annual expense ratios for these funds and it can vary based on the investment firm, investment advisor, um, and many of them have investment minimums. Um, and there may be some different tax strategies as well to consider when you purchase these. So individual stocks, you buy stock A, you own that. If you have a mutual fund, you oh, that mutual fund has bits and pieces of different things within that mutual fund. So a really common kind of question, concern we're getting from people, markets are down, what should I do? So we always like to show this slide just to show, you know, the market has gone down before. It's not the first time that this is happening. And we like to show how often it happens and kind of how long it takes to come back from that, that pullback. So while this can be stressful and pretty emotional for investors, um, you have to remember that you're invested for the long haul and not for tomorrow. Even if you're entering retirement, you need your money to grow for 10, 20, 30 years. So a market decline isn't gonna be the end all be all for your portfolio. It, it may happen again, it's likely to happen again. And the market has always rebounded from a market pullback. 
we have some clients calling or we've heard of people talking about, you know, markets are down. I'm going to sell everything. That is um, kind of not what we recommend. We recommend, again, again investing for the long haul. Um, it's really important if you do decide to sell everything and get out of the market to have a plan to get back in. That's kind of one of the downfalls that we see people have. They get anxious, markets are down, they want to sell everything, move to cash, and then they never get back in the market. So they miss out on a ton of opportunity to have positive returns in their portfolios. Um, this chart is really interesting. So it's declines in the S&P 500 since 1945. And you can see the different declines on the left there. If we just look at the 20 to 40%, so the number of times the market has been down 20 to 40% since 1945, it has happened nine times. So typically we see this every eight to 10 years, it can vary a little bit. And the average decline is 28%. Um, so if you've never experienced a market decline like this before, let's say you're in your 20s and 30s, 40s, maybe you haven't had a 401k or IRA in the past, this is kind of an emotional time for you. And it's also emotional for people who have experienced it, um, but know this has happened before. And then I have a slide that's going to show you kind of chances or choices people had to make when likely they could have sold, but if they kept investing in the market, their account would have had positive returns. So this chart you can see is the S&P 500 total return from March 2009 to December 2019. You can see all of these different events that happened throughout markets, throughout the environment, throughout different um, companies, things that happened, all of the reasons that could have made someone anxious, made them sell everything, made them move to cash. You can see in this chart, just an example, a little bit of a snippet of a stock market that shows even over this time, markets have increased dramatically. So again, if you are anxious, you pull everything out, move it to cash, be sure you have a plan to get back in but really you should be investing for the long run. And the best time to make sure your portfolio is positioned correctly um, is before an event like this happens. So it's really important to have a financial advisor or a financial planner, or if you like doing it yourself, just paying attention to your accounts. And as things change over time, making sure your investments in your account make sense for what your goals are. If you're someone who's closer to retirement, it might make sense to be a little bit more conservative. If you're younger, 20s, 30s, 40s, it might make sense to take a little bit more risk. So try to be proactive instead of reactive and really position your portfolio for the long run. Diversification is something that I'm sure you all heard at, have heard at different meetings, on the news, um, things like that. So oftentimes people come to us and they say, I'm diversified because I have my assets at five, 10 different investment advisors. And that's not necessarily what this means. So this means diversifying your assets among different investments, not necessarily investment advisors. So differentiating them, diversifying them among different asset classes. So between bonds, stock, real assets, um, having different regions in your portfolio, different styles, different size, different management, all of those things kind of tie in diversification. It's not necessarily how many different advisors you have your money with, it's how your buckets of money are invested and making sure they're not all in the same stock or the same bond or the same investment asset. They, I have a couple of select excerpts from 16 Rules for Investors to Live By. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Um, the first one, short-term thinking is at the root of most investing problems. So again, just really want to hammer home that you're investing for the long run. You are not investing to make a quick buck today, but rather to have your portfolio grow over the next 20, 20 30, 40, 50 years, however long, um, kind of what your time horizon is. So try not to be have knee-jerk reactions to different things happening in markets and think of that long-term perspective. How do you wanna be positioned for growth? And is your portfolio gonna be successful given your goals and kind of the risk level that you're willing to take? 
investing is overwhelmingly a game of psychology. So we always say there's so much emotion in investing. People see their accounts go down, their 401k go down, IRA go down, and they panic because they've contributed all of the money that they've worked really hard to save into that account. Um, if you take the emotion out of it, it'll be much easier to make sound financial decisions. And that's where maybe a financial planner or a financial advisor can help you do that. There are no points awarded for difficulty. So oftentimes the best um, strategies we see from people are investing in a diversified portfolio, something that matches your risk tolerance and just buying and holding that strategy. Some people try to time the markets, they buy and sell quick to make a quick buck. Um, it usually works out better for more people. If you have a diversified portfolio, hold that portfolio until you have maybe a life change, a risk tolerance change or something like that. All past market crashes are viewed as opportunities, but all future market crashes are viewed as risks. So obviously when you look back at the market, you'd see, oh yeah, I knew markets would come back from 08, 09 or 2001, I knew markets would come back. But now that markets are down now, you may be anxious and say, I don't think it's ever gonna come back. So again, it's a psychology of really thinking of it long-term and not really not having that hindsight bias. So remembering the market has always come up, it, it may go down again, it probably will go down again. Um, there are certain patterns in the markets. And again, markets go down 20 to 40% um, every eight to 10 years. And then you are only diversified as some of your investments are performing worse than others. So try to have your investments in different buckets instead of everything in one bucket. A bucket would be one investment. Have different stocks, bonds, maybe different assets and portfolios, but make sure your overall portfolio, you have a good handle on how much risk you're taking within those investments. So that was kind of a, a, a basic. Now I want to talk about making your money work for you. So you work really hard to save your money. You put it in your 401k, you put it in your emergency fund, you put it in an IRA. How do you make that money grow faster for you because you've saved so hard for it? So make time your friend and start investing early. Compounding is powerful. Powerful. The earlier you start investing, the longer your money has to grow. So if you are 20 and 30 and you are nervous to start investing, now is a perfect time to slowly start investing money. You're going to have, again, 30 to 40 years for your account to grow. So the earlier you start, the better. If you are 40, 50, 60, 70, and you haven't saved anything, it's not too late to start. It's always better to do something than to do nothing. Um, and then the earlier, again, you can start, the better your portfolio will be. Automate your savings to the extent possible. Um, so even a relatively small but recurring investment can grow significantly over time. Um, this eliminates the risk of, I'll do it next week, I'll do it next month, I'll do it next year. So a lot of people, some strategies that they use are to have maybe 200 bucks every month sent from their checking account to their savings account automatically. So they don't even have to think about it. It takes them having to think about it off the table, happens automatically. And before they know it, their savings account is much higher than if they would have done nothing or if they would have done some months, not every month. So try to do automatic investments as much as you can. Um, this is, you know, your 401k works like this. You set up either a percentage or a dollar amount that goes into your 401k. Great opportunity. And please take advantage of that if you are in a position to contribute to a 401k. And then give yourself a raise. So as your earnings increase over time, so should your savings rate. Um, kind of an industry standard is to save between 10 and 15% of your income annually for retirement. So if you're someone who's saving maybe 2%, each time you get a raise, bump up your contribution to your 401k by 1%. So let's say you get a 3% raise 
bump up your contribution to your 401k by 1% and you're still taking home more than you were before. So as your earnings increase, it's really common for people to have like a lifestyle creep. They start spending more. Maybe they want to buy a more expensive house, maybe more expensive cars, but it's really important to try to amp up your savings and not let um, some of your spending exceed what you're making. This is an example. We have four different individuals on the screen of kind of the impact of saving early and understanding your risk tolerance, how you're investing, and then how your ending portfolio um, is valued. So on this chart, we have Nervous Noah. He saves from ages 25 to 65, and he's super nervous, so he just saves in a cash account. So he saves $96,000 of his own money for 40 years. Quitter Quincy invests from ages 25 to 35, so she spends 10 years investing, and she invests in something that earns 6.25%, so she contributes $24,000 to an account, and then she quits when she's 35. Late Lila invests from ages 35 to 65, so she invests for 30 years, but she waits a little bit to start. She doesn't start right away at age 25 she earns 6.25%. So over those 30 years, she contributes $72,000 to an investment account. And then consistent Chloe invests from ages 25 to 65, so for 40 years, and she starts right away at age 25. And she also earns 6.25%. So she contributes, just like Nervous Noah, $96,000 um, to her account. I won't go through all of the numbers on the right, but you can see the drastic differences between the four, the four portfolios of the four individuals. Um, consistent Chloe obviously has the highest balance in her portfolio because she started contributing early and she contributed for her whole career um, for 40 years. Nervous Noah, who, you know, he consistently contributed as well for 40 years, but he was super nervous. He didn't want to invest in stocks or bonds, just in cash. You can see his account grew to 147,000. So still a really good balance, but you can see the potential that he could have had had he invested. So message of this is to start investing early. If you haven't started investing and you're a little bit later on in your career, it's not too late to start. So only one in three Americans have a financial plan in writing, which myself as a financial planning professional, I want that number to be three out of three Americans. Hopefully we can get that to two out of three eventually. Um, but budgeting is kind of the basics of financial planning. You can't really determine how much you can save if you don't have a budget in place. So it's a really good opportunity to have a conversation with your spouse, your partner, your family, whoever you share your finances with to talk about, you know, how much do you spend? How much do you save? Could you be saving more? Kind of putting your stuff into different categories. So you have needs, which would be, you know, your rent or mortgage payment, maybe a car payment, um, groceries, utilities, things like that, things you're going to need. Your wants, maybe you enjoy going out to dinner or maybe you go, enjoy going on vacation or you have maybe Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus and some of these um, subscription services. And then your savings, you know, your, your 401k savings, retirement savings, an emergency fund in the bank, different buckets. Um, it's really important to have an open and honest conversation with whoever you share your finances with to make sure you're on the same page and then make a plan going forward to make sure that it's consistent. Um, and then a general rule of thumb that we use is that an emergency fund should be sufficient to cover three to six months of expenses. Um, typically, if you are the only income earner for your family, you're gonna wanna have an emergency fund closer to that six months of expenses. If you and your partner or spouse both have earned income, you can kind of lean more towards that three months of expenses in an emergency fund. And that would be in a checking account, savings account, money market, anything that's easily accessible should an emergency happen. So saving for retirement, I'm sure you've heard of several different vehicles, different tax consequences, different contribution limits. 
If you're confused, you're not the only one. We hear often from clients and people in the community that they don't know the difference between pre-tax and Roth or you know, what's the difference between a 401k or an IRA and which one is the best option for me. Um, kind of deciding which one to invest in is something that a financial planner can help you with. But today I just want to cover the basics and give a good ground level understanding of what some of the differences are between these account types. So I'm going to start on the far right with Roth. So with these dollars, you pay the tax now, contribute the money to an account, and then it grows tax-free. And when you take the distribution out, a qualified distribution, you don't owe income tax or penalties. So this is a really good option if you're someone who is younger in your career. Um, it's a good option if you think eventually you'll be in a higher tax bracket. Um, and it's also a good option if you have kids or grandkids that you want to leave money to and you don't want them to be tasked with paying the tax on those funds that you gift them. Pre-tax in the middle, think about it as the exact opposite. So you have money, you don't pay the tax on it, you contribute it to this 401k or IRA, and then whenever you take a distribution, there will be ordinary income tax that you have to pay. So if you take a distribution from your pre-tax 401k or traditional IRA of $10,000, think of it just like getting a paycheck of $10,000 and you have to pay income tax on that. Um, so just the opposite strategy of Roth, most 401ks allow for Roth and pre-tax. You can always ask your um, retirement plan provider or your HR department if you have questions on what's available in your plan. And then individual joint or trust accounts are often called taxable accounts. These are taxed a little bit different than retirement dollars. Um, so these um, call into play capital gains tax instead of ordinary income tax. Um, so oftentimes, if people are maxing out their 401k, maybe they're maxing out an IRA, they look to an individual account, joint account, or a trust account to put funds into. Um, when you're in retirement, it's really good to have distribution or withdrawal options. So if you have a joint account, pre-tax dollars, and Roth dollars, certain years, um, you can say, I want to be in a lower tax bracket, so pick from this bucket. Certain years, you may not care, so you can pick from a different bucket. All of these just give you different options throughout retirement for if you need funds. There is something called a backdoor Roth IRA. Um, so if you make over a certain income amount, and if you Google Roth IRA income limits, it'll come up with the numbers for you, whether you're um, single, married, file, married filing separately, or married filing jointly. Um, if you make over that amount, you can't directly contribute to a Roth IRA. There are backdoor ways to do that. So if you're someone who is making over the income limit and you have questions, feel free to reach out to us and we can help you determine what the best way to accomplish that is. Your credit score is another thing that I think um, people should pay attention to, specifically Women, if you're the one managing, you know, paying your mortgage, paying your credit card statements, paying maybe a car payment, you want to get the lowest interest rate possible that you can. And a way to do that is to make sure you have a really good credit score. So just the basics, things that improve your credit score are paying your bills on time, paying down debt, um, not taking out a bunch of new credit cards at a time. And then if anything's inaccurate on your report, making sure you report it right away so that it's fixed. And then things that hurt your credit score, um, missing payments, using too much credit, applying for new credit over a short amount of time. So if you apply for five different credit cards, uh, a mortgage, uh, a car loan, all at the same time, that's gonna hurt your credit score. Um, closing accounts, and then again, defaulting on accounts, not making payments. If you ever wanna have a free copy of your credit report, you can get one every 12 months. You can see the website listed on the screen, annualcreditreport.com. I also utilize Credit Karma, which I can go and check and see all of my credit card balances. I can see if anything new has been opened just in case maybe someone got my personal information and opened a credit card in my name. Um, I'm really sure to check that just to make sure everything looks in good order. 
So this next section is real life scenarios, things that we talk through with clients, um, stories that have come up quite a bit with people who have questions on different things that come up in life. And these scenarios are really specific to women and kind of things that we've heard often and things that people need assistance with. So the first one is caring for an aging parent. Uh, women are more, li more likely than men to have to care for an aging parent. So this situation is Janice, and she's caring for her mother. So her mother is alone now that her father is passed. The mother was the caregiver, and it took a toll on her. Janice and her husband both work and are raising three teenage children. Her mom is now active has rebuilt a vibrant social life, and is in fairly good health. Janice is concerned about the future, and she's the only adult child in the area, and she has no real knowledge of her mother's finances. So this is a really common scenario that we see people coming in for, having questions about, you know, it's a lot of um, stress and pressure if you're the only adult child in the area, or if you're the only child who's willing to help out a parent. Um, it's kind of hard to balance your family, your savings, your activities with trying to help an aging parent. So some of the things we'll talk about today should hopefully get you on the right path. So it's really important to have conversations ahead of time. Um, if you've ever had a parent or someone um, close to you pass away or have an illness, you know that it's a really stressful time. It can be overwhelming to try to make different decisions. You may not be thinking clearly because it's so emotional, you're so stressed. So be sure to have these conversations while everyone's well, everyone's healthy, um, and also pick a time that's not Christmas day or when everyone's together for Thanksgiving. You want it to really be focused on finances and not a stressful time and have everyone really focusing on the, the, the content at hand. Include other important people and make sure you ask, you know, where do they want to live when they get older? Do they know where all of their financial accounts are held? If they get sick, how do they want to be cared for? Do they have an estate plan? Do they know where the document is and is it updated? There are a couple different documents. I'll just talk super high level at what you can talk about with your parents for things that they need or should have or could develop if they don't have it. So wills and trusts, are they current? Are they describing accurately how your parents want their assets to pass? Do beneficiaries know that they're a beneficiary? Do your parents want beneficiaries to know ahead of time? Executor, so who have your parents named to basically settle their estate? And is that person prepared to handle that role? We oftentimes have people come in who um, they, let's say, named a, a child as an executor, someone to settle their estate, and the child doesn't want to do it. They don't want to take on that burden. They don't feel like they're an expert in that area, so they don't want to um, step into that role. So there are corporate trustees, businesses who will do this, and you can name them in your document. Um, and then a trustee, you know, who have your parents named? Is that person aware? And are they prepared for the responsibility? The last thing you want is for something to happen to your parent and you are named as the trustee or executor and you don't want to take on the role. It's really important to have that conversation ahead of time. Power of attorney. So what kind of power of attorney do they have? This would be who can make financial decisions on their behalf. Is it you? Is it their sibling? Is it their cousin? Make sure they have something in place and you know where it is and there is someone named. Medical power of attorney, so have they designated someone to make their healthcare decision? And is that person willing and able to make those decisions on their behalf? And then living will, super important. What happens regarding very serious uh, medical treatment and medical decisions? Do they have specific things they do and don't want done in their care? Do they have someone who can kind of help make those decisions? What is their wish should something happen to them? Next, we're gonna to move to a first time home buyer. We have tons of clients and people that we work with who, you know, they're, they've saved up a lot of money. They wanna buy a home. They don't really know how to do it and they don't know how to prioritize 
paying off debt, saving for retirement, and buying the home all at the same time. So in this situation, this individual has worked full-time for seven years. She contributes to her 401k, um, and she gets the full match from her employer. She has life and disability insurance through work. She does have outstanding debt, so she has student loans, car debt, and credit card debt. And she's really unsure how to balance all of those things at the same time. So super common, um, I don't want to say issue, but super common scenario that we help people with. So the first thing is to focus on paying off high interest rate debt. If you have a credit card and you're paying, you know, 13, 15, 18% on that, it's going to be really hard for you to save for a house if you're paying that debt and paying such a high interest rate. Um, you want to make sure your credit score is in tip-top shape so you can qualify for a lower interest rate. And then once you pay off or pay down some of these high interest rates debts, it's going to improve your cash flow and allow you to save more for a down payment or an emergency fund or something like that. Um, this, this graph on here shows um, at a credit card rate of 16%, if you made minimum payments and you had a bill of $10,000 to pay off, you would end up paying over $12,000 in interest if you make minimum payments. So if you have a lot of high interest rate debt out there, write it all down, kind of see where you're at with different accounts, and then determine or work with a financial planner to determine which one is the most sense, which one makes the most sense to pay off first, and how should you prioritize making those payments. Create an emergency fund. So we touched on this before, but when you own a house, tons of things can happen. You may need a new roof, a new furnace. Um, you may have um, water issues. Maybe you need new windows really have this emergency fund created prior to purchasing a home. And consider down payments and mortgage costs. So um, it's recommended to put 20% down on a home to avoid um, PMI. You can qualify and look into different first time home buyer programs and then pre-qualify for a mortgage. Some real estate agents will only work with you if you're pre-qualified. So pay off that debt, increase your retirement savings, create an emergency fund, um, take into account you're going to need funds for the down payment and you're going to need funds for, you know, real estate taxes and increased home insurance, things like that, and pre-qualify for a mortgage. And then newly divorced. This, unfortunately, is also a common one that we talk through with many men and women. Um, but an interesting fact is that gray divorce is on the rise. Um, among adults age 50 plus, the national divorce rate has nearly doubled since 1990. And for people age 65 plus, it has tripled. So more and more people are getting divorced and older people are getting divorced more than they ever have. So in this scenario, we have a couple, um, the individual went through a divorce after 20 years with her partner. She negotiated equal division of the assets. They do have a college age son and share joint custody of their daughter. However, no alimony or child support will be paid. They each kept their own retirement accounts um, and they sold the family home and they want to each buy their own property. So super common scenario, you're getting divorced after 20 years, all of your finances are intermingled. How do you separate those and how do you make sure you're not missing different things in your um, kind of financial plan? So evaluate the current situation. It's really important to establish a new storage place for key documents. And this could be um, asset statements, tax returns, uh, credit reports, your estate plan, so your trusts or will, make sure you have everything collected and keep it in a safe place. Create an inventory of accounts of financial interest, so make sure you know where all of your 401ks are, IRAs, bank accounts, things like that. Review your credit report and then create a budget and track spending. Oftentimes when you get divorced and you move to a new home or you move to an apartment, wherever you're moving, you may have a different budget than when you were married. Maybe you're spending less on going out to eat. Maybe you're spending less on groceries. Um, maybe you're spending more on different services, whatever it is. Create a new budget and see what that looks like specifically for you. 
make sure to protect yourself. So retitle any assets um, that are yours into just your name. Update beneficiary designations on accounts and policies. So we see this time and time again. Um, people get divorced. They forget to change the beneficiary on their 401k or IRA, and they still have their ex-spouse listed. They pass away, and those assets go to the ex-spouse. So make sure you update that. If you want it to go to your children, your friends, your cousins, whoever, just make sure it's um, accurate for who you want your funds to go to. Build up your own emergency fund of six months of income. Um, you are earning on your own now. You don't have a partner to earn with you. So you want to make sure you have a bucket of money to fall on just in case something happens. Understand your qualified domestic relations order, which relates to retirement assets. How are those going to be split? Are you getting anything from your spouse? Are you giving anything to your spouse? Make sure you understand how that works. And then upstate, update your personal insurance and estate planning documents. So again, if you want all of your assets to go to your kids now instead of your ex-spouse, make sure you update that sooner rather than later. So a couple takeaways, actionable steps you can take today, tomorrow, next week to make sure your finances are trending in the right direction. So first things first, emergency fund. We talked about that a couple of times today, but this is really, really important. You never know when you're gonna have a house repair that's unexpected. Maybe you have an illness that came up out of nowhere. Maybe you get laid off from your job. It's really important to have this fund established ahead of time. Create a budget and reevaluate during life transition. So if you are getting married, reevaluate your budget. If you're getting divorced, reevaluate. If you have a new baby or maybe you're um, getting married and your new spouse has children, reevaluate your budget. If you are retiring, reevaluate your budget. If you're switching jobs, reevaluate your budget. We see that a lot of times with people, they're switching a job and their income is going to be either a lot higher or a lot lower. Make sure to take a look at your budget and see how that's affected. Contribute to your 401k plan enough to get the full match. I can't say that enough. If you don't contribute enough to get the full match, you're leaving free money on the table. So for example, if your plan matches your contribution up to 4%, put in 4%, so they put in 4%. If you put in 1%, they're only going to put in 1% and you're missing out that extra 3%. So really do this. If it fits in your budget, it should be a top priority to make sure you're putting in at least enough to get the full match. Determine who you want your assets to go to when you pass, especially if you have minor children. So create an estate plan with an attorney. If you have questions on who to work with, what that process looks like, we can definitely give you recommendations. If you have minor children, think about life insurance. If you were to pass away tomorrow unexpectedly, what would your family live off of? Make sure you have enough insurance to cover you know, any debt that you have. If you want to pay for education for your children, cover that amount. Um, just kind of be, again, proactive instead of reactive. And then double check beneficiaries on IRAs, 401ks. I always check mine annually, even if I know nothing's happened just to be sure there's still the people listed that I want my funds to go to should something happen to me. And then think of your goal short-term and long-term. A goal could be, I want to retire at the age of 65. How can I accomplish that? Or a short-term goal could be, I want to go on vacation in five years and how can I do that? Or I want to pay off a credit card in two years. How am I going to accomplish that? So you're more likely to get something done if you write it down rather than not thinking about it or just having it in your head. So a lot of information, but just wanted to go over a couple basics that women should know in investing. Um, probably answered some questions that you had and hadn't previously had the opportunity to ask. Um, if you have any questions, again, feel free to reach out to us. You can check out our website below or schedule a meeting with us. Um, we're happy to talk through different questions that you have, different options, um, and things as well. As I mentioned in the beginning, Emerge 360, we do investment management for relationships 50,000 and up. We do ongoing financial planning. We have a dedicated um, local team here in La Crosse. We also have clients 
all over the country and we can utilize Zoom for meetings as well. And then we have really good technology. Um, you, you can view accounts online, do some really cool things. So it's kind of a, a, a package that we have for investment management relationships over 50,000. So um, if you are someone who's divorced and you're looking for a new investment advisor, aside from your ex-spouse, we would love to work with you. If you and your current spouse or partner or yourself are just looking for more information on financial planning or investment management, um, we would love to see if we could work together. Um, thank you for attending today. Hopefully you took away a couple of things um, that you can either work on or that you learned. Again, those couple steps that we talk about are really actionable things that you can work on today to kind of kick off your financial plan and your financial journey. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to call or email and we'll be happy to help. Um, again, this session was recorded and we will be sending it out probably next week. Um, so feel free to rewatch it if you missed anything. Um, thanks for attending and have a good night.